In this video, we will explore the early life and upbringing of Osama bin Laden, including his family background, education, and the ideological influences that shaped his beliefs. It will also discuss the political and social context of the Middle East during this time period, including the Iranian Revolution and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. These events had a significant impact on bin Laden's worldview and his eventual involvement in extremist activities. Additionally, we will examine the role of his family's wealth and connections in shaping his trajectory, as well as the formation of Al-Qaeda and its goals. Osama bin Laden was born on March 10, 1957 in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. His father, Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden, was born in Yemen in 1908. As a child, his family moved from Yemen to the red coast of Western Arabia, which is now part of Saudi Arabia. However, at that time, the region was disputed between the Ottoman Empire and the Royal House of Saud. He became a successful construction contractor in the 1930s, working for Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, the first ruler of Saudi Arabia. The Saudi bin Laden Group, founded under the patronage of the royal family, became a highly successful construction company in Saudi Arabia. It thrived in a nation that was rapidly growing as the world's largest oil exporter and home to wealthy families like the Bin Ladens. Osama's mother was Hamida al Atas, a Syrian native from a family of prosperous citrus farmers near the port city of Latakia. At the age of 14, she married Mohammed, a wealthy man who was 48 years old at the time. She became his tenth wife in 1956. Osama was born a year later. They had just one child and Muhammad and Hamida split up shortly after. Speculation has arisen that their marriage may not have taken place and that Hamida was only briefly Muhammad's concubine. Osama had a privileged upbringing. When he was born, his father was already a wealthy man with a fortune that would be worth billions today when adjusted for inflation. Following his parents' divorce, Osama's mother married Muhammad al attas a business associate of Muhammad bin Laden. In the 1960s, they had four children, three boys and one girl. Osama grew up in his mother's and stepfather's household, living with them and his step-siblings. However, it would be incorrect to imply that he had a distant relationship with his father. Muhammad bin Laden had a significant impact on his son's upbringing, passing on his strong religious beliefs. Osama attended the al Thagr Model School in Jeddah, starting in 1968. In 1971, he had the opportunity to experience the Western world firsthand when he was sent to Oxford University in Britain for an English language course. He also exhibited typical traits of young boys during his childhood and early teenage years. He was a football fan who supported the Arsenal Football Club and had an interest in military history. Although Osama's younger years seemed ordinary, his background was far from typical. In the 1960s, the Saudi Bin Laden Group emerged as a major corporation in the Arab world. The company had deep connections with the Saudi royal family and was entrusted with managing repairs for the mosques in Mecca and Medina, the two most sacred cities in the Islamic world. In 1964, the company won the contract to renovate the exterior of the Dome of the Rock, a significant Muslim religious site in Jerusalem. In 1967, Mohammed Bin Laden, who had extensive ties with the Saudi royal family, tragically lost his life at the age of 59 in an airplane accident in Saudi Arabia. The pilot misjudged the plane's landing, leading to the unfortunate incident. Despite facing a setback, the Saudi bin Laden group thrived under the leadership of Mohammed's sons from his earlier marriages. In the 1970s and 1980s, it diversified and grew into a multi-billion dollar company securing lucrative contracts throughout the Middle East. Osama did not participate in the Saudi bin Laden group's business activities after his father's death because he was too young at the time. Instead, he pursued further education. In 1976, at the age of 19, Osama enrolled at the King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. He pursued studies in economics and business administration, likely to join the family business in the future. However, he had already started to deviate from his interest in business. People who knew bin Laden reported that his main passions were religion, poetry, and Arab literature. He did not need to worry about money, 
as Osama was set to inherit over $30 million from his father's estate, ensuring his education and future work. By this time, he had already gotten married to his first wife, Najwa Ghanem, a Syrian woman in 1974 when he was only 17 years old. Additionally, she was his first cousin from his mother's side and one of at least five wives. Osama had a large number of children throughout his life. The mid to late 1970s played a significant role in shaping Osama's life and ideological views. However, the available evidence from this period is often incomplete and conflicting, making it difficult to draw clear conclusions. However, his views are straightforward to understand. From an early age, Osama started developing a pan-Islamist ideology. This movement advocates for the unity of Muslims across nations to defend and promote their faith. This perspective reflects the era of the Arab Caliphate, which governed a large portion of the Middle East, North Africa, and neighboring areas from its capital in Baghdad during the 8th to 11th centuries. In the 1960s and 1970s, pan-Islamism aimed to decrease or eliminate Western involvement in the Middle East. This region had been under British and French control since the end of the First World War, and the United States was also becoming more involved as British and French influence declined. Osama grew up in the Middle Eastern world, where Israel, supported by the United States, often clashed with its Muslim neighbors. This was evident in the Six-Day War of 1967 and the War of Yom Kippur in 1973. The writings of Sayyid Qutba, an Egyptian Muslim scholar and political theorist who was a Muslim Brotherhood member up until his arrest and execution in 1966, had a significant influence on Osama. Qutba's writings gained popularity in schools and universities across the Muslim world, starting in the 1940s. He argued that Islamic Jihad, or the struggle against evil, was justified by the establishment of a new Islamic caliphate. Additionally, he advocated for the imposition of Sharia law, which is based on a strict interpretation of the Quran, in all Muslim states. Qutba's writings often expressed a strong anti-Western sentiment, as he criticized the United States for being materialistic, godless, and devoid of spiritual values. Qutbah had a significant impact on bin Laden's ideological beliefs during the 1960s and 1970s. Interestingly, Qutbah's brother Muhammad, a fervent advocate of his brother's ideas, taught at Abdulaziz University in Jeddah during Osama's time as a student in the late 1970s. Osama completed his studies at Abdulaziz in 1979. It's not clear whether or not he completed his degree. At this moment, the timing was particularly important due to the turmoil in the Islamic world. Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini led the establishment of a new Islamic state in Iran following the 1978 Iranian Revolution, which saw the removal of the Western-backed Shah from power. In Iran, political chaos was unfolding, while Afghanistan to the northeast was also experiencing a similar situation. In 1978, the PDPA took control and started building a socialist, non-religious state. Russia has had a historical interest in Afghanistan since the mid-19th century, when it served as a buffer state between Russia, British India, and Pakistan. The PDPA had strong connections with the Soviet Union. However, there is little evidence to suggest that the Soviets were the main catalyst behind the PDPA's takeover of power in Afghanistan in 1978. Nevertheless, they developed strong connections with the new Marxist regime in Kabul after it gained control of the country. As Islamist groups and other opponents of the PDPA started revolting against the new government in 1978 and 1979, the Marxist regime quickly sought assistance from Moscow. Initially, there was only limited support, but as the situation for the PDPA worsened, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in late December 1979. In early 1980, Moscow deployed thousands of Soviet tanks and tens of thousands of soldiers to occupy the main cities of the country. Before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, bin Laden swiftly traveled to Pakistan after completing his studies at King Abdulaziz University. Pakistan has played a major role in international jihadist movements throughout the 20th and early 21st centuries. For years, the country has claimed to oppose Islamic fundamentalism within its borders. However, 
It has ignored this issue, largely due to its ongoing rivalry with Hindu India since the partition of the British Raj in 1947. Pakistan would have a significant impact on bin Laden's life for the next 30 years. After he arrived in 1979, he swiftly became associated with Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian-born jihadist who had a significant impact on numerous high-ranking Islamic terrorists in the late 20th century. Azam urged bin Laden to join the Muslim men going to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviet invaders. These individuals came to be known as Mujahideen, which roughly translates to one who engages in holy war, or jihad. During the early 1980s, bin Laden started using his inherited wealth to recruit and train Mujahideen in Pakistan. These fighters then went on to the mountainous regions of Afghanistan. However, his financing was much smaller compared to the billions of dollars spent by the United States and Saudi Arabian governments. They provided extensive support and training to anti-Soviet forces in Afghanistan and Pakistan, using them as proxies to fight against the Soviet invasion. Furthermore, it is important to note that claims regarding bin Laden's financial and training support from American agents during this period have been overstated. However, it is undeniable that he did have limited interactions with U.S. Special Forces in the region during the 1980s. The war in which bin Laden participated from 1980 onwards unfolded similarly to conflicts in Afghanistan over the past two centuries. The Soviets deployed 80,000 troops by the end of 1980 and had superior weaponry, allowing them to occupy and maintain control over the main cities in support of the Marxist PDPA. However, the regions outside of the cities were largely under the control of Mujahideen groups, which had both moderate and fundamentalist branches. The Hindu Kush mountains, which dominate a large part of the country, especially in the east and north, provided a perfect setting for guerrilla warfare during the Soviet-Afghan War in the 1980s. The fighting escalated, with the Soviets resorting to brutal tactics, including indiscriminate bombing and the destruction of rural villages, in their efforts to eliminate the insurgents. In the mid-1980s, a significant number of people in Afghanistan were displaced, with many becoming refugees in Pakistan and Iran. The conflict led to a large number of deaths. It quickly gained a reputation as the Soviet counterpart to the Vietnam War, as the Russians grappled with an unbeatable enemy. During this time, bin Laden played a significant role in the Mujahideen movement in Afghanistan. Initially, he supplied goods to fighters in the country and helped individuals travel from Saudi Arabia to Pakistan for training and equipping before being sent north to fight against the Soviets. Over the years, bin Laden frequently traveled between Pakistan and the Mujahideen strongholds in the Hindu Kush mountains. In 1984, he and his mentor Abdullah Azam founded Maktab al Khidamat an organization to raise funds to support the ongoing war against the Soviets. The funding was used to acquire weapons and provide training to Mujahideen. In 1986, the network had trained numerous fighters stationed in eastern Afghanistan at bin Laden's base, al Masada, also known as the Lion's Den. In the late spring and early summer of 1987, the Mujahideen took action against the Soviets and the Marxist regime at the Battle of Jaji. The battle had limited strategic importance in the larger war, but it earned bin Laden a notable reputation among the Mujahideen and in the Arab world. Jamal Khashoggi, a rising Saudi journalist, wrote reports on the battle that contributed to this in part. Although Khashoggi was associated with bin Laden, they held contrasting political and religious beliefs. Maktab al khidamat played a crucial role in the 1980s setting the stage for the jihadist movement that bin Laden is now closely associated with. As the war in Afghanistan neared its end, there was a growing concern about the future of the organization. There were differing opinions among members about the future direction of the organization. Some wanted to keep it moderate and focused on countering the Soviets, while others, like bin Laden and Abdullah Azam, believed it should become a larger entity with a mission to remove non-Arab powers from the Arab and Muslim world. In 1988, bin Laden and Azam founded a new organization called Al-Qaeda, which translates to the base or the foundation, 
This was a result of the more extremist wing of the movement. Over time, it grew to become the largest jihadist organization globally and is now infamous for its worldwide notoriety. From the beginning, Al-Qaeda aimed to wage holy war or jihad against non-Muslims in various regions, including the Middle East, Lower Central Asia, the Maghreb in North Africa, as well as peripheral parts like Somalia, Mali, Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa, Indonesia, and other Muslim regions. Its ideology focused on eliminating American influence in the Middle East and dismantling Israel, which it saw as a Western stronghold in the Levant. Gradually, the group started to believe that it should provoke a significant war with the United States to rally the Muslim world against non-Muslims. Due to the organization's inability to engage in direct conflict initially, it resorted to employing terrorist tactics during its early years. In addition, Al-Qaeda saw moderate Muslims as straying from traditional Islam and aimed to establish a strict form of Islamic governance throughout the Muslim world based on Sharia law and a literal understanding of the Quran. When Al-Qaeda was formed in 1988, the war in Afghanistan was already coming to an end. When Mikhail Gorbachev assumed leadership of the Soviet Union in 1985, he made it clear that he aimed to end Soviet involvement in the country. Similar to America's gradual withdrawal from Vietnam, the Soviets also faced challenges in quickly pulling out. There was a notable increase in the number of Soviet troops in Afghanistan in an attempt to quickly win the war. Unfortunately, the efforts were unsuccessful as the Reagan administration persisted in providing substantial military and financial support to the Mujahideen. After receiving Stinger missiles to target Soviet helicopters, the Mujahideen guerrilla war saw a remarkable surge in success for the insurgents. The Afghan government, the Soviet Union, the U.S. and Pakistan all signed peace agreements in 1988. The last Soviet troops were withdrawn in 1989. The Marxist regime gradually lost ground to the Mujahideen groups and eventually collapsed in 1992. However, once the communist regime was removed, the different Mujahideen groups began to fight amongst themselves. The Taliban emerged as the victors in 1996 after four years of civil war. However, they never gained complete control of the country. The Northern Alliance held much of the North until the late 1990s and early 2000s. After the Soviet-Afghan War, Bin Laden went back to Saudi Arabia in 1989. He was warmly celebrated for his contribution to removing the Russians from Afghanistan. He started working with the Saudi Bin Laden Group, his family's business, in the Arabian Peninsula to utilize its economic power and business connections for the growth of Al-Qaeda. He also started meeting with other prominent members of the Islamic Jihadist movement in Egypt and other places. Relations between bin Laden and the Saudi government started to worsen during this period. Bin Laden aimed to escalate his conflict with non-Muslims, while the Saudi government maintained its role as a crucial American ally in the Middle East. Bin Laden and the Saudi regime clashed over the South Yemen civil war. Bin Laden wanted Saudi Arabia to directly intervene and remove the Soviet-backed Yemeni Socialist Party, but the royal government in Riyadh prevented him from doing so. Another problem arose with a neighboring country, Saudi Arabia, leading to tension between Bin Laden and the Saudi government. This eventually led to a complete breakdown in relations between him and the Saudi royal family. On August 2, 1990, Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, invaded Kuwait, a wealthy Gulf state that Iraq owed billions of dollars to. Iraq had borrowed this money to fund its war against Iran in the 1980s, a conflict in which it received significant support from the United States. The invasion resulted in the swift conquest of the small city-state, sparking global outrage. Soon after, the United States formed a coalition of military allies, including Britain, France, Germany, and many other nations, to launch a counter-invasion of Iraq. It received support from various Arab and Muslim nations, including Egypt, Syria, and Saudi Arabia. In the autumn of 1990, while negotiations for a peaceful settlement were ongoing, American troops started deploying to the Middle East for a military buildup. They primarily headed to Saudi Arabia, intending to use it as a staging post for the liberation of Kuwait and the attack on Iraq in case negotiations failed. 
On January 16, 1991, the U.S. military initiated what they called Operation Desert Storm. Bin Laden was furious from the start of the military buildup when the Saudi government agreed to a proposal by the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, for America to intervene and stop Iraq's aggression from spreading into Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden arranged a meeting with the Saudi ruler, King Fahd, and asked that American troops be banned from gathering in Saudi Arabia. He offered to use his own Arab Legion, which was formed in Afghanistan during the war, to protect the Saudi border from any potential Iraqi invasion. The offer was rejected, and the U.S. and coalition troop buildup increased in the subsequent weeks. Bin Laden publicly criticized the Saudi government, accusing them of allowing Western infidels into the kingdom, which he believed should be the protector of Islam's holiest sites, Mecca and Medina. He tried to persuade the ulama, the senior Saudi religious scholars, to issue a fatwa condemning the American incursion into the Arabian Peninsula. This led to a fatal rift between bin Laden and the Saudi government, resulting in his expulsion from the country in 1991. Operation Desert Storm swiftly defeated Iraq and liberated Kuwait in the spring of 1991. Instead of attempting regime change, the U.S. opted to leave Saddam Hussein in power, withdrew its troops from the region, and imposed severe sanctions on Iraq. Bin Laden was expelled from Saudi Arabia in 1991 and then moved to Sudan in 1992. In 1989, Colonel Omar al-Bashir took control through a military coup that resulted in minimal bloodshed. He swiftly enforced Sharia law in Sudan, creating an ideal refuge for bin Laden to operate from. Hassan al-Turabi, the speaker of the Sudanese National Assembly and a prominent figure in Sudan, personally invited the Saudi Mujahideen to Sudan. Bin Laden quickly established himself in a secure compound, which was defended by his loyal followers in Al-Qaeda using advanced weaponry. Mujahideen set up new training bases near the capital of Khartoum, and bin Laden had a residence in the city. Due to the unrestricted control he had in Sudan, the country was labeled as a state sponsor of international terrorism. This happened after the Gulf War, when bin Laden and al-Qaeda started to attract more attention from the American Intelligence Service and the State Department. During bin Laden's time in Sudan from 1992 to 1996, the U.S. closely monitored his activities through regular flyovers of his compound and other intelligence gathering. In 1996, U.S. sanctions against Sudan for harboring bin Laden and other Islamic fundamentalists and terrorists had a significant impact on the country's economy. In addition, President Omar al-Bashir had successfully outmaneuvered Hassan al-Turabi, who was bin Laden's main supporter in the government. By 1996, it became evident to bin Laden that Sudan was no longer a safe haven. After being expelled, he returned to Afghanistan, where the Taliban had recently gained control over a large part of the country. He was invited as a personal guest by Mullah Muhammad Omar, the initial leader of the Taliban government. In August 1996, he promptly declared war against the United States through Islamic media channels. He argued that the U.S. had occupied Saudi Arabia through military bases since 1990 and was the main supporter of Israel in the region. Some believe that bin Laden's actions in 1996 were motivated by the loss of his family's wealth when he left Sudan. The expulsion order further radicalized him and led him to wage a full-scale war against the United States government. The U.S. sanctions against Sudan played a role in pressuring the Sudanese government to take the stance it did. Starting in 1996, bin Laden and al-Qaeda were fully dedicated to carrying out terrorist attacks against the United States. These have always been a part of how the organization operates. In 1990, the Federal Bureau of Investigation raided El Sayed Nosir's home in New Jersey. They found documents related to plans for blowing up skyscrapers in New York City. A truck bomb exploded outside the North Tower of the World Trade Center in Manhattan in 1993. Ramzi Youssef, the leader of the attack, was also affiliated with Al-Qaeda. He had received training in one of their camps in Afghanistan during the late 1980s. Bin Laden financed and organized the bombing of the Gold Mihor Hotel in Aden, Yemen, 
in 1992. Many believe that Al-Qaeda played a role in the Luxor massacre of November 1997. During this tragic event, six Islamic fundamentalist gunmen killed 62 individuals, mostly Western tourists, in the Egyptian city near the Valley of the Kings. By the late 1990s, Al-Qaeda began increasing its attacks on Western targets using terrorist methods. The attacks quickly intensified. Truck bombings happened on August 7, 1998 in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya. It was clear which nation was the symbolic target of these attacks, as the bombs were detonated outside the United States embassies in the two capital cities. These attacks were quite intricate. As an example, the bombing in Nairobi used 500 cylinders of TNT, while the Dar es Salaam bombing involved two 2,000-pound bombs. The blast was directed and amplified by using ammonium nitrate fertilizer, resulting in extensive damage to the embassies. In addition, the bombs were detonated at nearly the same time, causing the loss of 213 lives in Nairobi and 85 in Dar es Salaam, with many more injured. It is undeniable that bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were responsible. Shortly after the bombings, bin Laden was added to the FBI's list of the 10 most wanted individuals. It also made Al-Qaeda known to all intelligence services in the Western world, but unfortunately, they didn't fully understand the extent of the threat posed by the terrorist organization. Following the bombings of U.S. embassies, bin Laden further intensified his criticism of the United States. He had several grievances, such as U.S. support for Israel and for regimes that persecuted Muslims, like Russia's crackdown on Chechnya, the Philippine government's attacks on the Muslim Moro population, and India's oppression of Muslims in Kashmir. His main concern, though, was the presence of American troops in the Arabian Peninsula, particularly near the holiest places of Islam, Mecca, and Medina. In 1998, Al-Qaeda claimed that the United States had been occupying Islamic lands for seven years. As a result, they shifted their focus from attacking U.S. embassies to planning a larger attack on American soil. Surprisingly, they chose to target the World Trade Center in New York City, a location that Al-Qaeda affiliates had previously attempted to attack in 1993 with a truck bomb. The second attempt would have a greater impact. In the late 1990s, bin Laden approved the World Trade Center initiative, originally proposed by an Al-Qaeda affiliate named Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in 1996. In the rest of 1999, potential candidates for the attacks were screened in Afghanistan. The leaders were required to have English language proficiency and experience living in a Western society. Several individuals, including Mohammed Atta, Marwan al Shehi, and Ziad Jarrah, were promptly chosen. Another individual, Hani Hanjar, was chosen when it was discovered that he possessed a commercial pilot's license and had proficient skills as an airplane pilot. In 2000, 19 individuals were chosen and placed in terrorist cells across the United States, specifically in Arizona, Florida, and California. In early 2001, targets were chosen with the intention of hijacking commercial airline planes and carrying out suicide terrorist attacks by flying them into buildings. The Twin Towers, which were the main buildings of the World Trade Center, were the main targets, along with the Pentagon in Virginia. There were also plans to fly a fourth plane into the U.S. Capitol building, the seat of government in Washington, D.C. The attacks were scheduled for a specific date, September 11, 2001, with terrorist cells in position to carry them out. Many people believe that this date was chosen because September is the ninth month of the year, and the date, when written out in the American dating system, is 911, the same number used for emergency call services in the United States. It's more likely that bin Laden chose September 11th because it coincided with the day in 1683 when John Sobieski III, the King of Poland, arrived in Vienna to help defend the city against the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Sobieski's victory ended the Ottoman expansion in southern Europe. After centuries of Muslim expansion in the eastern Mediterranean and the Balkans, the Christian world faced increasing pressure. However, the siege of Vienna marked a turning point as Christian Western powers started to encroach into the Muslim world. 
bin Laden selected this significant date to convey that the 2001 attacks by al-Qaeda on the United States would signify a shift in favor of Islam. On September 11, 2001, 19 hijackers started carrying out their orders in separate groups. Five hijackers boarded American Airlines Flight 11, departing from Logan International Airport in Boston at 7.59 a.m. and heading for Los Angeles International Airport. Five additional passengers boarded United Airlines 175, which was also traveling from Logan to Los Angeles. The plane departed from the Boston runway 15 minutes after American Airlines Flight 11. At 8.20 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 departed from Washington Dulles International Airport in Virginia near Washington, D.C. Five hijackers were also on board. At 8.42 a.m., a fourth plane, United Airlines Flight 93, departed from Newark International Airport in New Jersey, bound for San Francisco. Only four hijackers were on this plane. What ensued was a day that would forever be remembered. The hijackers quickly took control of all four planes shortly after they took off. At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center, traveling at a speed of about 750 kilometers per hour. Amidst the speculation in Manhattan, United Airlines Flight 175 was altering its course in the sky. At 9.03 a.m., just 17 minutes after the initial impact, the second plane collided with the South Tower, traveling at a speed of 800 kilometers per hour. Less than 30 minutes later, American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the west wall of the Pentagon in Virginia. United Airlines Flight 93 crashed into a field in Pennsylvania when passengers tried to regain control from the hijackers, missing its intended target. The plane crash marked the start of the devastation. At the time of the Twin Towers attack, there were already more than 10,000 people inside starting their day's work. Due to the damage caused by the initial impact and fires on the upper floors, the evacuation efforts were hindered as people had to navigate numerous staircases, resulting in a moderate pace of evacuation. The upper floors, where the planes crashed, became engulfed in flames. In a matter of minutes, desperate individuals resorted to jumping from the building to escape the horror. The South Tower collapsed at 9.59 a.m. after being hit second. The North Tower followed 29 minutes later. A total of 2,606 lives were lost in the towers and on the ground, along with 147 passengers and crew on the two planes. At the Pentagon, the damage was not as extensive, but it still resulted in the tragic loss of 125 lives on the ground, as well as 59 crew and passengers. All 40 crew and passengers on United Airlines Flight 93 tragically perished. The September 11, 2001, attacks were incredibly destructive and remain one of the worst acts of terrorism in history. In addition, the story was quickly picked up by media outlets worldwide, and footage of the planes hitting the towers became widely accessible. As a result, the psychological impact of the attacks was unprecedented in terms of terrorism. Initially, Bin Laden denied any involvement in planning the 9-11 attacks on the United States. He made a statement on September 16, which was later broadcasted by Al Jazeera. In the statement, he denied responsibility. However, more proof over time came to back up the assertion by American intelligence services that he and Al-Qaeda were responsible for the attacks. In 2004, a video was released by Al Jazeera in which he admitted to directing the 19 hijackers involved in the September 11, 2001 attacks. In 2006, more admissions were made, and video footage emerged showing Osama conversing with some of the hijackers before the attacks. Bin Laden mentioned that he targeted the Twin Towers as symbolic revenge for the destruction of buildings in Beirut during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. During the 9-11 attacks, it was believed that bin Laden was hiding in the White Mountains, located in the eastern part of Afghanistan, near the border with Pakistan. The U.S. President George W. Bush's administration swiftly passed a joint congressional resolution on September 18, 2001, authorizing the use of force against the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks. Since 1996, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan has provided shelter to bin Laden and al-Qaeda, 
and they refused to hand him over to American authorities. As a result, the entire regime became a target. On October 7, 2001, American and British aircraft started bombing strategic targets in Afghanistan. Connections were made with the Northern Alliance, which controlled portions of the country in opposition to the Taliban. The U.S. deployed special operatives into the country starting in late September. However, the main land invasion, involving American troops and allied contingents from many nations, began on October 19. The United States and its allies achieved a quick victory in the war in Afghanistan. In early November, American forces had surrounded the capital, Kabul. Mohammed Atef, one of bin Laden's top allies and the third-ranking member of al-Qaeda, was killed in an airstrike on the city on November 12th. The next day, Northern Alliance and U.S. troops started to enter the city, while the Taliban either escaped into the mountains or headed towards the southern city of Kandahar. The Taliban made their final major stand in late November in that city. The war seemingly came to an end when the remaining forces surrendered in early December. In early December, a new interim administration was established, with Hamid Karzai as the first president of Afghanistan. Unfortunately, this initial victory turned out to be deceptive, as Afghanistan soon became plagued by insurgent revolts that proved impossible for the U.S. to overcome. Bringing bin Laden to justice remained elusive despite the invasion of Afghanistan. The U.S., however, had almost reached its goal. Amid Kandahar's fall to the west, a coalition of Allied fighters, including U.S. Special Forces and other special operatives, joined forces with Northern Alliance fighters to launch a campaign in the Tora Bora cave complex. This operation aimed to target the hiding place of bin Laden and numerous other Al-Qaeda members. The Battle of Tora Bora lasted nearly two weeks and took place in the mountains and caves. According to American intelligence services, Bin Laden was believed to be present during these clashes. However, he managed to escape because the Allied military presence was not enough to capture him. It is believed that he crossed the southern border into Pakistan shortly after. At that time, Bin Laden was the most sought-after individual globally, with the U.S. government offering a reward of $25 million for any information that could lead to his capture or demise. The figure rose to $50 million in 2007 as the manhunt for the leader of al-Qaeda and the architect of the 9-11 attacks persisted. Bin Laden and al-Qaeda would continue to pose a threat to America and the Western world for an extended period. There has been much speculation about Bin Laden's location since he escaped from Afghanistan in 2001. He had become the most wanted person globally and gained worldwide recognition. His movements were kept hidden, and even today, the U.S. intelligence services can only piece together some of his whereabouts from the 2000s. It seems that he, like many other senior al-Qaeda members, spent most of these years in Pakistan. The Pakistani government did not officially tolerate his presence here. Over the years, successive regimes in the capital, Islamabad, have been known to support Islamic terrorist organizations. However, they were unable to approve of bin Laden's presence on Pakistani soil. However, the U.S. intelligence services faced challenges in locating bin Laden within the country, as they had to deal with limited support from the Pakistani security services. He is thought to have spent a significant amount of time in Waziristan, a mountainous region in northern Pakistan, close to the Afghan border, after fleeing Afghanistan. Some reports suggested that he may have relocated to Iran, but these were likely false. The truth is that bin Laden and al-Qaeda were able to reside in Pakistan without much trouble for several years, thanks to the support of influential figures within the country's politics and security services. Throughout this period, bin Laden and al-Qaeda persistently orchestrated terrorist activities across the broader Muslim world. After 9-11, a comprehensive security system was implemented in American airports and other areas, making it much harder to carry out attacks on the United States. Yet, the Middle East now had an abundance of Western targets. In late 2001, American, British, and other Allied troops occupied Afghanistan, and they would continue to be present there in various capacities for the next two decades. 
However, Iraq soon experienced a significant increase in Western presence. After defeating the Taliban in Afghanistan, the U.S., under President George W. Bush, made it known that they planned to pursue regime change in the Middle East. Their focus was on states they believed supported terrorism. Removing Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq was a top priority after the Gulf War. Many of America's allies, including France, criticized this policy, claiming that the Bush administration was using the 9-11 attacks as a cover for regime change in oil-producing countries and promoting U.S. neo-imperialism in the region. In March 2003, the U.S., Britain, and several smaller allied nations invaded Iraq. They claimed that Hussein's regime was seeking weapons of mass destruction and supporting bin Laden. Bin Laden frequently mentioned the economic sanctions imposed on Iraq by the U.S. after the Gulf War as one of his grievances against America. However, there is no solid evidence to suggest that the Hussein regime provided significant support to bin Laden. The invasion unfolded similarly to the one in Afghanistan. The Ba'athist regime of Saddam Hussein was swiftly defeated, and President Bush declared U.S. victory in the war just two months later. However, the situation in Afghanistan became increasingly complex when a fierce counterinsurgency campaign started in the summer of 2003. This campaign lasted for years, as various factions within Iraq attempted to expel U.S. forces from the country. Bin Laden and al-Qaeda played a role in this internal conflict. They attempted to create divisions between the Sunni Muslim minority and the Shiite Muslim majority to incite a civil war in Iraq. A terrorist attack occurred on February 22, 2006, when the al Askari Shrine in Samarra was bombed. Although there was no significant loss of human life, this action led to the destruction of one of Iraq's most sacred sites for Shiite Muslims. It also sparked days of sectarian violence in Baghdad and other areas resulting in the deaths of at least a thousand people. By the late 2000s, the war in Iraq started to stabilize due to a significant increase in American troops in 2007 and political reforms that helped reduce the violence. Despite this, al-Qaeda persisted with their campaign. Bin Laden, from Pakistan, authorized bombings in Baghdad and a suicide bombing on the Shiite Imam Hussein Shrine in Karbala, in March 2008. This attack caused 42 deaths and left many others injured. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, bin Laden had relocated to a newly constructed compound in the city of Abbottabad in northern Pakistan. The construction of this was started soon after bin Laden arrived in the country in early 2002 and finished in 2005. The compound was situated on a 38,000 square foot estate and enclosed by a tall concrete perimeter fence topped with barbed wire. There were only a few windows and numerous screens to obstruct the view inside. One of the screens, located on a third floor balcony, was specifically designed to provide privacy for bin Laden, who stood at an imposing height of six feet, four inches. Surprisingly, the authorities didn't realize how unique the new property was, considering its clear focus on security. Likely bin Laden resided there starting in 2006, along with his wives, children, and followers. The city is located near the Pakistani capital, Islamabad. Bin Laden's compound in Pakistan served as his shelter for several years, but his excessive dependence on it ultimately led to his downfall. In 2009, U.S. intelligence services discovered that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, a trusted courier and messenger for bin Laden, had previously been with him during the Battle of Tora Bora in December 2001. This incident was significant as bin Laden narrowly escaped capture by the U.S. at that time. Al-Kuwaiti's role as a courier became crucial while bin Laden was hiding in Pakistan. The CIA discovered in 2009 that Al-Kuwaiti was residing in Abu Tabad. Additional information allowed them to pinpoint the bin Laden compound as an unusual structure in the city. Funding from the U.S. Congress was secured to establish a CIA team in Abbottabad. This team started monitoring the compound and its occupants in 2010. Despite a comprehensive effort and the utilization of advanced drone and surveillance equipment, the team failed to capture any photographic or concrete evidence confirming bin Laden's presence 
in the compound. However, by early 2011, the mounting circumstantial evidence left them convinced that this was the hideout of the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks. On May 1, 2011, U.S. President Barack Obama authorized Operation Neptune Spear. At noon in Washington, D.C., however, just 30 minutes later, around 11 p.m. in Afghanistan, two Black Hawk helicopters with two dozen Navy SEALs departed from an American airbase in Afghanistan and flew across the border to Pakistan. The helicopters landed in the compound at Abbottabad just over an hour and a half later, at half past midnight on the 2nd of May in Pakistan. A helicopter crashed during the landing. Fortunately, none of the Navy SEALs were injured. They started fighting immediately upon landing, engaging in a short firefight with some of bin Laden's followers. Next, the Navy SEALs entered the main compound. In Washington, D.C., President Obama and senior government and defense officials observed live footage of the raid from the Situation Room in the White House. On the second floor, the Navy SEALs encountered and shot one of bin Laden's adult sons, along with another follower named Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. Al-Kuwaiti's presence in Abbottabad initially raised suspicions that bin Laden might be hiding in the city. As they went back upstairs, they discovered bin Laden on the third floor. Their instructions were to eliminate, not capture, the al-Qaeda leader. There are different accounts regarding who killed bin Laden, with various Navy SEALs claiming credit. However, it is believed that Matt Bissonette shot bin Laden in his bedroom doorway at 39 minutes past midnight local time. Bin Laden then stumbled back into the room and fell to the floor, resulting in his death. Bin Laden was discovered with $500 and two mobile phones concealed in his robes, presumably in case he needed to escape during an assault on the compound, similar to the one that ultimately resulted in his demise. It ended in a rather pitiful way. It was decided in advance to quickly dispose of bin Laden's body in a location that would prevent it from becoming a shrine for Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists. After his death and the securing of the compound, the Navy SEALs placed the body of the Al-Qaeda leader in a body bag and took it to the intact helicopter. Following a thorough search of the compound for valuable intelligence and a better understanding of bin Laden's activities, the team left with his body on the only working helicopter. An additional helicopter was requested to retrieve the remaining Navy SEALs. It was confirmed by 8 p.m. in Washington that the body belonged to bin Laden. A few hours later, President Obama addressed the nation to share the news of the raid's success. While he was doing that, bin Laden's body was being transported to an undisclosed location at sea and disposed of by weighing it down with iron chains and rocks to ensure it sank to the sea floor. It was done within 24 hours of his passing to honor Islamic tradition. Unfortunately, Osama bin Laden's death did not lessen the threat that Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists pose to the West or the majority of Muslims in the Islamic world. Despite their brutal tactics, Al-Qaeda was losing ground to more extreme jihadi movements by the time of bin Laden's death. In 2004, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, a Jordanian jihadist, joined al-Qaeda in Iraq to fight against the U.S. occupation. In 2006, al-Zarqawi and his closest allies joined forces to create the Islamic State of Iraq. In the years that followed, their power grew, but their methods also grew more ruthless. They resorted to brutal tactics against Muslims who did not adhere to strict interpretations of Sharia law. After the U.S. forces left Iraq in the early 2010s, Al-Qaeda and the U.S. took different paths in the Middle East. This led to a complete split between the two organizations after bin Laden's death, with Ayman al-Zawari taking over as Al-Qaeda's new leader. Surprisingly, by the 2010s, Al-Qaeda, the group responsible for the 9-11 attacks, was considered too moderate by some Islamic fundamentalists. As a result, the Islamic State of Iraq group gained more followers among potential jihadists. The Islamic State of Iraq gained global attention in the years that followed. After the Arab Spring of 2011, Syria was engulfed in a brutal civil war. Meanwhile, the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq resulted in parts of the country slipping out of the control of the government in Baghdad. Under its new leader, 
Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the Islamic State was able to gain direct control over a large area spanning northern Iraq and eastern Syria. In 2014 and 2015, the group known as ISIL gained global attention when they declared the establishment of an Islamic caliphate. Even al-Qaeda distanced itself from them as a result of their actions, which were characterized by extreme brutality. ISIL gradually lost control over eastern Syria and northern Iraq from 2014 to 2017, when the U.S. deployed troops to the region. In recent years, Islamic fundamentalism has shown signs of decline. This can be attributed to the improving living standards in the Middle East, the decreased focus on nation-building by the United States, and improved relations between Israel and its Muslim neighbors. The primary danger of Islamic fundamentalism appears to have moved from the Middle East to the Sahel, a region along the southern border of the Sahara Desert. In this area, jihadi groups have destabilized countries such as Mali, Niger, Chad, and Burkina Faso. In 2021, the Taliban regained power in Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrawal. Osama bin Laden is widely regarded as a highly influential figure in the history of modern Islamic fundamentalism. He started to become more radicalized in the 1970s after being influenced by Islamist scholars like Sayyid Qutb. With his growing radicalism and access to financial resources from the bin Laden business empire in Saudi Arabia, along with his connections in Saudi society, he was able to train and equip Mujahideen to fight the Russians during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. If his career had ended there, he would be a mere footnote in history. However, after the war against the Soviets ended, he dedicated himself to a broader agenda of Islamic fundamentalism. During the Gulf War, his actions revealed his increasing anti-American sentiment and his readiness to distance himself from Muslim regimes, like the Saudi royal family, if they took actions that went against his interpretation of Islam. In the 1990s, a more extreme version of bin Laden and al-Qaeda started to emerge. This was evident in the increasingly brutal bombing campaigns, with the most severe being the U.S. Embassy bombings of 1998. These bombings resulted in the loss of hundreds of lives and left thousands injured. However, the 9-11 attacks on the United States are what bin Laden and al-Qaeda are most notorious for. In September 2001, 19 hijackers carried out attacks on bin Laden's orders, resulting in the deaths of over 2,700 people within a few hours. Many others also lost their lives in the following years due to related injuries. The psychological impact was equally harmful. Many people vividly remember their whereabouts and activities on September 11, 2001, when news of the attacks and footage of the planes hitting the Twin Towers spread through the media. That day brought about significant changes in many aspects of life as security measures were implemented across the Western world to prevent future attacks. There were numerous wars in the Middle East with major incidents in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places frequently making headlines for years. This led to the emergence of ISIL and a Mediterranean migrant crisis as millions sought to escape Syria and Iraq. When bin Laden was killed, it marked the end of his reign of terror. His death occurred in a fortified compound in Abbottabad, where he had been hiding for five years. However, the impact of his violent extremism had already left an indelible mark on the world.